Well, if you know that scripture, you know it's Psalm 133. And then I realized that there was more than one there. And I found out from the moment God created man, he wanted to bless man. And so when you go back into, into Genesis, you find out that when God created man, he blessed man. And then the enemy came to steal the blessing. So God wants to restore that. And all through the scriptures, there are commanded blessings. In other words, he's put his command on the blessing. And all we need to do is find out what it is he commanded a blessing on, walk into it, and you've got the blessing. So um, that is, it's pretty exciting. Um, about 20, 22 chapters of, of commanded blessings. And so, um, and how many you know the blessing of the Lord makes poor and adds lots of sorrow to it? I was just checking if you knew the scriptures. Blessing of the Lord does what? Makes rich. Isn't that good? And that adds no sorrow to it, so I think that's pretty good. So I'm going to ask you a question. You ready? How is your heart doing? Not so good, better. A lot of people are looking at their shoes. You always know if they look at their shoes, oh, God, that's my eye. So um, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about your heart. I, what the Lord did to me yesterday, he said, I want you to start a series on Touched by God. And so I started the series. Uh, we do a discipleship class on a Saturday morning. And I started the series in the discipleship class. We, we had a lot of people weeping. I like that. I, I never get compliments. This is nice. All right. So, <laughs> so it was powerful. Welcome back. <laughs> um, and so basically what I, I did is I opened the Scriptures and began to show you what a heart looks like when it's been touched by God. All right? And um, I want to say this to you, that you can have your heart touched by God, but God wants to keep touching your heart. That's why David, who clearly had his heart touched by God, keeps asking God to touch his heart. He found out his heart wasn't what he wanted it to be. Now, it tells us in Ezekiel and chapter 11 and verse 19, it's prophetic of what's going to happen. It tells us there that the Lord says, listen, I'm going to give you an uh, undivided heart. So the first thing you ought to say, this is not the message today, but the first thing you ought to say, if my heart's divided, it needs to get touched by God. All right? The second thing he says, I'll take your heart of stone and I'll turn it into a heart of flesh. Which means that which can't be moved becomes very movable. And a soft heart, you see, when God touches someone's heart, it becomes very soft, pliable, movable. In fact, you know that your heart's been touched by God because you weep. You move by things. You move by anything. You become like him. Your heart is very movable. And, and there was a whole teaching there that you can get hold of because it was online. But I want to actually tell you a little bit more about your heart. How many of you know that you can cram your heart full? It tells us in the scripture in, in Matthew 12, 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, which means the heart can get crammed full. It actually says in Psalm 119 and verse 11, it said, your word... Have I hid within my heart, or King James, hidden within my heart, that I might not sin against you? When you look that word hid or hidden up, it actually means to be crammed full. So in other words, I've crammed my heart full, and it actually means like a hoarder. That's what it means. So I've hoarded in my heart a whole crammed up. You know, instead of hoarding newspapers, I've, 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 I've hoarded the things of God. Well, what you don't know is that you are a hoarder. You either hoard things that are good or you hoard things that are bad. I mean, come on, in marriage, you know, without any words of knowledge yet, have you ever just suddenly burst out to your spouse something that you hadn't been thinking about for years? Tell the truth. So one person's honest in the whole group. And you said, where did that come from? You hoarded it. You crammed it in, right? And out it came. And you said, well, that was 22 years ago. But for some reason, it just came out. Why? Because it was still in there. It hadn't been dealt with. It was crammed in. You catching that? So you are a whole bunch of hoarding 
hearted people. You're cram full. Have you ever heard that statement? You're so full of it. <laughs> See, you only get it bad, but you're so full. I've always wanted to prophesy to someone, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> King James, thou art full of it. And behold, says the Lord, I'm about to squeeze thee. Because when he squeezes you, whatever's in you is going to come out. So I want you to just get this deep within you. You are hoarders. Now, it depends what I hoard, what happens. For instance, in Psalm 45 and verse 1, depending on how you read it, King James or NIV, it makes this statement. My heart is indicting a godly theme. The word actually means my heart wants to gush out what's in me. So in other words, whatever I hoard gushes out. That's why Jesus was trying to tell them in Matthew 12, 34, what, what you've hoarded up now comes out. So it can come out in your marriage, it can come out in your worship, it can come out in your complaints. You're only a complainer because your heart is. Does that make sense to you? If you think something about something, it will come out in the end because it just will gush. God tells us in Proverbs 4.23 that we ought to watch our hearts above everything else because out of it come the issues of life. One version says out of it is the wellspring. It overflows out. Whatever is in there is going to come out. So in other words, if I can get my heart to be affected and touched by God, then what's going to come out of my heart is the things of God. If I cram my heart with other things, that's what's going to control my life. That's why I need a touch of God. So I want you right at the beginning to say, I need a touch of God. For instance, watch David, who, who had quite a heart. I mean, it tells us in, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, that God looked for a man after his own heart. And if you read that in the original version, it means that God was able to invade David's heart with his own heart. And it literally means that David's heart overflowed back the heart of God. And yet David had some little issues. And what we tend to do because of our own hearts is we tend to prefer to look at David's issues than who he was as a whole person. What you don't know is that if, you, if you study David, you'll find out that he's 10th generation illegitimate. And that came by incest. He also, his great-grandmother was a Moabitess. That came by incest. And it tells us that that won't get you points with God. So in David's life, out comes this stuff. And he suddenly realizes there's, a, there's an area of his heart that is not crammed with the right thing. So he says in Psalm 51, he said, oh God, create in me. Get hold of my heart. Do something in this heart. There's an area of my heart that is just not right. Create in me, oh my God, a clean heart. Get your creative hands on my heart and, and get some of your goodness where this area is. Now, it's not your fault what you come from in family, but it's your fault what you do about it. All right? Uh, my family, uh, for instance, I'm going to tell you this. I'll pretend that we're in, in the living room. I'm just chatting with you. Uh, some of you know I've got a weird name. I've got a two-barrel name. My real name is Goldsworthy. And my father changed the name before I was born to Davis, which is my Irish grandmother. All right? And so, and so when the Lord talked to me, he told me to take back my family name, which means take back your inheritance. And some of you know the miracle that happened. The day I took back the name, there was a miracle. Well, I said to God one day, thinking that I was walking in a Goldsworthy curse. All right? And, and literally, you know what the Goldsworthy curse was? That when you go against the name Goldsworthy, which means worthy of gold, and you cancel it, which my dad did, it canceled the blessing of the name. So imagine, why would you not want to be called Mr. Worthy of Gold? I mean, every time you talk to me, I'm prophesy you're prophesying to me. 
And so, you know, we, we rectified that. And, and then I went to the Lord one day, and I was saying to him, thinking I knew what I was talking about. Now, how many of you know, most of you don't know what you're talking about most of the time. So you're thinking you know what you're talking about. And I said to the Lord, I, it's almost like the Lord said, what are you talking about, Willis? I mean, I don't know. So. And I said to the Lord, I want you, Lord, to break the Goldsworthy curse over my life. And he, he retorted to me and said to me, it is broken. And then said to me, how many times have you been married? And I'm the first Goldsworthy that I know of that wasn't married and divorced and married and divorced. My grandfather never, ever divorced his first wife when he, when he married my Irish grandmother. So in other words, as a pre but when I got saved and when I did what the Lord said, he broke the curse. Not only did it break the curse, but it released the finances back. So my brother's two sons, one of them's um, probably a multimillionaire, just a young man, and the other one is so blessed. Why? Because we reversed the curse. So here's David saying, Lord, there, there is a part of my heart, you, you know my heart's for you, but there's a part of my heart that's messed up. So I'm asking you, Lord, to get those hands that work the clay, and I'm asking you to create in me, work in me, change my heart in this arena. This will help you enormously. Because David was the one that had the, the, the salvation walk before salvation came. You know that, don't you? Psalm 51 and verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Psalm 110 and verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, He met the Lord before the Lord ever came. So he's saying, Lord, get your hands on my heart and create in my heart that which is need. Clean my heart up. Put your pure hands and get hold of my heart and, and massage my heart and create something new in me until my heart becomes like your heart. Now, right now, we could just stop and fall down because all of us have got something. So you've got to know this. Some of what your heart is doing, even though touched by God, is coming from something. How many of you know that some of you got habits? You're not, you're not nuns. No, no, you're not nuns. And some of your habits aren't great, are you? Well, how about taking your dirty habit <laughs> to the Lord and saying, Lord, there's an arena that needs the creative power of God to touch my heart. Touch my how many how many of you know bitterness is not godly? How many of you know that resentment is not godly? It's a habit that you've developed. You can't say what you want to say to the person you want to say it to, so you just keep it in your heart, and the resentment keeps up in your heart. Take that resentment and say, Lord, get your creative hands all over my heart, and this area needs you to touch it so that I can think like you. If God treated us like we treat one another, we'd be finished. But we want his heart, don't we? We want, to, want our heart touched by him. So what I'm really saying to you is that we can affect our own hearts. So I'm going to read you a scripture. That was all to get me to the scripture. It's found in Proverbs 3 and verse 1. I'm just going to read it the NIV just because it's readable, all right? The reason I don't often use the King James is because you spend more time explaining what you just said. So I'm just going to read it in a readable version. Proverbs 3 and verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching... But keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Notice the heart. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You see the heart's there twice. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's three different things that you can do to your heart right there. You do it, all right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, all right? In all your ways, acknowledge Him or submit to Him. I like the word acknowledge there. And He will make your path straight or direct your paths, all right? In other words, if your path isn't straight, you might not have done the right things with your heart. Does that make sense to you? If, if your way in, uh, in front of you is muddy and foggy, 
there's a possibility that you have lent on your own understanding and not lent on God. And you know, it's hard today because we, we educate ourselves and we, our natural education wants to argue with what God says, right? And then it goes on to the next statement, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. What's he saying? There are things that we can add to what God is doing in our heart. There are choices that we make. Now listen to Psalm 119 and verse 11 again. Your word have I hid in my heart. I've, I've hidden it. I've hoarded it. I've built it up so that when sin comes at me, your word in me will come back out. Now, I'm asking you a very honest question. We've got to be honest this morning. Have you ever been tempted? Now, please don't tell me the temptation. Don't put up a screen and say it was like this. No. If you've ever been tempted, it depends what you have in you, what you will do with the temptation. Is that true? So what, what, what the psalmist is saying, and this is one that knows temptation. Psalm 190 is just brilliant, all right? He, he knows temptation, and he's saying that I found the answer to the temptation. I'm going to get your word, and I'm going to cram it into my life. I'm going to cram it. I'm going to cram it. I'm going to hoard it. I'm going to hoard it. And what's in comes out. See, a lot of people will say to me, how come you can quote so many scriptures? Because I've crammed them. You catch it? I, I, I'm a cramming scripture person. What have I done is I've meditated on and memorized many scriptures. And so they cram. But we need to cram things that help us in our lives. If you know you have a particular arena in your life, whether it be a temptation, whether it be a weakness, whether it be a fault. You know, I always use the word fault because we hate to use the word sin. Whatever that is in your life, you're the only person that knows what I'm talking to you about right now. Why would you not now search out the scriptures in that arena? And cram them. Fill yourself up with them. So that when that happens, I mean, there's not one person in here, and we're not touching any, there's not one person that hasn't been tempted to, to be adulterous. There's not one person that hasn't been tempted to lie and cheat and steal and all the rest of it. But what happened in that second was with what you had crammed in. Whatever was crammed in came back up. I know there were some times of terrible attacks, and it was the fear of the Lord suddenly would come up inside me. Uh, I, I'm always careful what I say in public, but have any of you ever run into a real demon? Not a person pretending to be one? You know, lots of people pretend to be one. You can tell if you're running into a real one because it's real. Uh, it, it will change atmospheres. It's violent and, and ferocious and evil. I ran into one, literally. I was drawn into, into one. Someone was doing a deliverance session with someone that had been down into Mexico and somehow had touched something that had been dedicated. And when they touched it, literally, a spirit of death had leapt onto their lives. I got drawn into it as a young minister. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just read all the right books. I read about Oral Roberts. You put your right hand on it. The, the demon doesn't like your right. I did all that stuff. And, and so I went to pray for this person, just like, we need authority. And I thought, okay. You know, John Wayne walked in there. <laughs> you know, the way you walk in is not always the way you walk out. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you know, we did, okay. Yeah, I'll come in. Yeah. And, and I walked in there. And, and, and as I went to pray for the person, the Lord said, I want you to cast out the spirit of death. He said that to me. Now listen to my educated idiot box. I went, that's ridiculous. This is to, to God. You've never done that, have you? You've never said that to God. I said, that's ridiculous. This is what I said. If they had a spirit of death, they would be dead. <laughs> this is my English education coming out. It was deep. And I was told again, cast out the spirit of death. So I went to put my right hand, because I'd read that Oral Roberts used to put his right hand, so the right hand. I found out sometimes it's the left hand, but I, I put the right hand, and I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not trying to scare you. 
As I put my right hand out, a physical being hit my hand. And of course, according to my understanding, it wasn't allowed to do that, but it did it. Because it knew I didn't know what I thought I knew. So I, I, I kept going like that. You're not going to stop me. I got really annoyed. Right in the middle. Of, and, and I went and I said, oh, I'm telling you now, and as I use these words, in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit of death to come out. As I said that, a force from hell hit me. I went back up in the air like this. I was in the air. And you've got to be there. you just got to be there. This would make a good movie. In the air. As I'm in the air, I say to myself, self, run. <laughs> you know, this is all going on in a split second. As my feet hit the ground, the Spirit of God that was crammed inside of me rose up inside me. And I said to that, you will not and you cannot do that to me. I went to put my hand back and it kept fighting. I got my hand on the person's head and what was in me broke what was in that person and they were delivered. Now, learn from my experience. Cram yourself because you never know anything. But what was in me came up in the middle of the war. Does that make sense? So what he's saying is, listen, my son, don't forget my teaching. Don't use us, I mean, I'm not that good, but don't use us for entertainment. Most annoying thing that's ever been said to me after I preached, I love your accent. But what is his name? You didn't hear the message, you heard the accent? I've got a great retort now. People always say to me, do I detect an accent? I said, yes, and so do I. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing. I'm listening to your accent, but I'm not listening to your teaching. You're entertaining me. And there are some entertaining preachers. I, I, I think T.D. Jakes is exceptionally entertaining. Brilliant and entertaining. But if all you do is get entertained, you're, you're not going to remember a thing. In other words, you need to be taking notes. Mike takes copious, do you know that word? Copious notes. He scribbles on books and writes and writes and writes. Do you? Or do you just sit there going, that's a good thought, that's a good... But to not forget it, you need to do something. For instance, when I was ministering last week in um, Arizona. Now, how many of you know, if you think it's rough here, go to Arizona. They've even got this desert sickness thing over there. And you get, my eyes started to swell up because in the desert. But the guy came off the platform and he prophesied over me. And I, I, I'm all for prophecy. I like the encouragements of the Lord. But he prophesied so long, I have no idea what he said. I just heard something about training somebody and something. And so I just wrote to him. I said, could you translate that for me? That was, I said, talking about copious notes, this was copious words. And, and, and he poured all these words on me, and I couldn't remember what he said. But you know what I did? I said, there was something in there from God. I need to get that, so I read that, so I hear that. So my son, don't forget my teaching. Don't forget what you've heard from me. Don't forget one prophetic word. Don't put it on a shelf. Memorize it, pray it, stand on it. Stand on the Word of God. Read it. Now, this is a shock for you. Read the Bible. Well, I don't have time. You lie more than you've even... What? Me? Bah! What? You don't have time? You've got time to watch TV. You can even play it to yourself. You can plug this in on the way to work, and it's always a very nice accent. And the Lord says to you, you've got the whole thing. But what he's saying is, don't forget it. Cram it. All right? He's saying to you, keep my commands in your heart. Lock them up in there. See, God knows what you need. Have you noticed when you read the Bible, certain things jump at you? God knows what you need, therefore he speaks to you. But he doesn't speak to you to say, mm, that was good. And how many of you have been around when there's a prophecy and people clap it? That is the most ridiculous thing. 
the Lord just spoke to you. And you went, can you, can you imagine big old Dustin talking to Solomon? Solomon! Yes, Dad. Oh, Dad, you spoke. Oh, it's his sister. Dad spoke. Oh. No, 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 no. He doesn't speak to be clapped. He speaks to be heard. I want you to become crammers. Whatever you hear today, cram. I, I might suggest that you might want to go get this message again because there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. You've got to be crammers. And, and you can even look like a crammer if you want. What does a crammer look like? You, you've seen a hamster, haven't you? And you say, well, what's happened? I've just been cramming the word. It's really important to you. And you know that we, we live in a generation where we don't cram the word. We listen to it, we're entertained by it, and then we're off. It tells us the birds of the air can steal it the moment you walk out there if you don't cram it. Has God even said anything yet that you ought to take a note and say, hey, write that down. That's very important for my life. Then it says, for this will prolong your life. In other words, the Word of God crammed in you brings life within you and causes your life to lengthen because of the Word that's so alive in your, in your life. All right? And then it says, and bring you peace. How many of you are always praying for peace? Well, the Lord says you don't have to pray if you eat my Word because my Word brings peace on its own. Isn't that beautiful? And then, the word that all Americans love to hear, you ready? One, two, three. And also bring you prosperity. It means success. God actually wants you to succeed. He actually wants you to prosper. How many of you know if you prosper, you can bless somebody else? I love that. You know, and Americans, and I've lived and, and traveled all over the place, you really are the most, the, the, the most generous people in the world. That's not true of a lot of nations. But someone crammed full with the Word of God is so blessed by what they crammed full with that they overflow in prosperity and they're able to bless other people. How many of you want to ignore that? What he's saying is add it to your life. Your choice, if you want a heart that's touched by me, I'm giving you some instructions. Add it to your life. All right? And then it goes on. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Now, let's just talk about that for a second. You know that there are three different words for love in the Bible. We're not, we're not going to just spend hours on them. You know, there's, there's the erotic love, eros, which means you, you know, you, you're lusting and you're turned on. You got it? Thank you. Do you need me to tell you some more? Oh, all right, you got it. Then there's brotherly love. So when Jesus has that wrestle with Peter, he says to him, do you love me like I love? And he says, no, I love you like a brother. Now, that's brotherly love, and, and that's a love. But it's all run by the big boy, which is called agape love, the love of God. So what he's saying is, let God touch your heart, and when God touches your heart, His love will fill your heart. Then you don't let it leave you. It's your job to hang on to love. Have any of you ever, ever seen uh, marriages have a, a wobbly time? Someone has to hang on. If we both fall out, and we both say, I'm just done with you. We're not hanging on, are we? Just hang on to what you got. What you got, girl, you got a lot. What of? Love. If he touches you, you got love. Your job to hang on. I told you the story about when I went fishing with John Dean when I first arrived. John Dean is bigger than him. Huge man. And we went fishing. And as we were fishing, John got his line tangled up. And John was 6'3", at least, I suppose, weighed about 280. Huge man. And his line got tangled up, and, and, he, and he said, we need, to go, we need to go to shore because we, I, I, I can't untangle my line. So, so we moved into shore. I can't remember how he did it. I felt like a orangutan, you know, something like that. And we moved into shore. And then as we went into shore, we went to dock the boat, and the, the boat moved. And so I was at the front, 
And John said, catch it, catch it. You know, this huge man at the back making the boat move because he was so big. So I, I got caught. So I went like this. But listen, I'm only five foot eight when fully stretched, and I was about to be. Maybe if I'd stayed there longer, I could have hit six two. So I, I, I reach out, and I get hold of the, the edge, literally the edge right there of, of the platform. I get my fingers on there, and the boat has moved so far that all I've got left is my toes. So I've got my fingers there, and my toes are there, and, and I'm fully stretched. You know, you, you, the video that we're going to watch in heaven one day of this matter. Now, to add to the problem, John Dean starts to laugh. And he laughs like a Texan. Like that. And as he laughs, he starts to belly laugh like this. And the boat is moving like this. I'm hanging on with my fingers and my toes thinking, stop, John, stop. He said, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. But I did hang on. And this is what I did. I was quite strong. So I started to do this with my fingers. And with my fingers drew me and this massive man back to the platform. That's what hanging on means, my friends. You don't hang on till it doesn't suit you anymore. You hang on to love, and you won't let that thing go. Even if, uh, even if people turn against you, even if circumstances turn against you, hang on to love. Don't let it go. Secondly, hang on to faithfulness. How many of you know, well done, you good and faithful servant, not well done, you who turned up occasionally? Hang on to faithfulness. Get it in your heart, friends. There's two, two things I've done in my life that, uh, you know, you were drummed in with. Number one, I, I did karate for a while, so don't you mess with me. No, I did karate for a while, and you know what they did? They drummed it into you. You practiced, you practiced, you practiced, you did, you did, you did. And you, you found yourself doing it as you were walking. You, you found yourself doing it. And the other... <laughs> The other thing is I was in the British military, and uh, they, they, they taught you to march, and they so taught you to march that you found yourself doing it in your sleep. And I would, I would walk up to, to the edge of the road, and I would go. <laughs> I mean, I've always been a bit different. I get that. But you just... Did you do that when you were in the military? You start doing whatever it is they do, and you find yourself, and I found myself marching. We didn't march like, you know, the Americans. We marched with your arms up like this, you see. And so I found myself, I'm walking down lanes going. <laughs> when I look back now, I'm sure the Lord's got some great videos of me for me to say, you know, we had a job. How many of you know you've got an angel? The Bible says so. My angel has already been to the Lord. And he said, can I have a break? He, he's always crashing forward. <laughs> so, but what I was trying to tell you is that faithfulness is built into you. You do what you do till that's what you do, and that's what creates faithfulness. You're not spasmodic. Is that a word that you know? You, you're not in and out. You're not up and down. You build faithfulness into you. It's something that you build. And he's saying you've got to build this love, and you've got to build this faithfulness into you. It's your job. I'm giving you the touch, but it's your job. Does that make sense? I, I wrote to Chris this morning on the way in. I said, they're always saying that you don't have to uh, go to church to be a Christian. I said, but if you're a Christian, you'll go to church. I can tell where you're at. Uh, here's a story. Can I give you a story? Many, many years ago, back in Scotland... There was, a, there was a minister, and one of his main players, one of his deacons from his church, had stopped coming. He waited for a few weeks, and uh, he still didn't turn up. So being pastoral, the Scottish minister went to, to visit him. And when the deacon opened the door, he bristled. You know what? And the pastor figured, I might not need to say anything, and there might be a war. 
So he, he came in, sat down, and the fire was burning. And he looked at the deacon, and he got the pair of tongs and grabbed a coal out of the fire. Put the coal on the hearth and sat and watched it. And as he watched it, the fire began to go out. And then it began to glow, and then it went to nothing. And the deacon said, I'll be in church next week, pastor. <laughs> you catch it. Yeah. You've got to build it in, my friends. I know you've got lots of reasons not to. I mean, obviously, you are the busiest person in San Antonio. <laughs> I, I know that. There's so many businesses to keep your hand on. You've got 100 children, 15 wives. You're so busy. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this in your own mind. We all have time for whatever we want. We need to build faithfulness into us. Now listen to what it says happens. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them on your neck. In other words, he's telling you, wear this thing. Wear it so that it can be seen. All right? And then he says, not only bind, but write it on the tablet of your heart or write it on the table of your heart. In other words, make sure that you know that your heart's got it. You know, you know this, before Dave Beckham, the soccer player, came out with all the tattoos. I lived in the day when you had tattoos, it meant one of two things. It meant that you were either part of a gang or you were part of the military. Well, I was in the military and I was covered in tattoos. And uh, some of them have gone and some of them I wish were gone. And um, when you tattoo, it hurts you. Try taking them off, it hurts more. And uh, you, when you tattoo something, it costs you something. It costs you money. It costs you pain. It costs you blood to get a tattoo on. And folks, we need to get this. If we're going to write it on the tablets of our heart, it's going to cost us something. You know, you, you don't just go into church and say, got it. <laughs> you have to got it. I got it. I'm going to write that on my heart until my heart's got it. How many of you know to memorize costs you something? Particularly if you're over 50. <laughs> I, I'm trying to learn Spanish so hard. <laughs> and I listen to something, and I drive in the car, listen, and he says, say this, say this, say this. And I say it, and the next day I forgot what it was I said. <laughs> and yeah, I learned some French when I was a kid, and I remember the French. But folks, you have to, do you want this or don't you? Do you want this, this life of God or don't you? It's up to you. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to get a hammer and chisel on some hearts. But, it's, but, but you've got you to do it. It's up to you. And then this is what it says, okay? Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. In other words, God looks on you with favor because you lock on his word and his love and faithfulness with favor. He says, oh, there comes Homer. Oh, there comes Dustin. They're my children who walk my way. I know their name. I know technically he knows all of our names. I know that. You know, they're, we're, we're, they're, they're written on the palms of his hands, but he knows you intimately because you've bothered to be intimate with him. So when you turn up, a friend just turned up. Not only, you see, how many people would just like to find favor with some people? But what God's saying is you don't have to go trying to win friends. Win me. And if you win me, it's shocking how much my winning will affect other people's view. I mean, who hates a loving person? Get that filthy love away from me. Who ha hates a faithful person? I mean, Demon, as faithful as the day. There he is. He's wearing yellow so you can see him. He drives, for, uh, he drives a yellow cab. He's wearing yellow. But what a faithful guy. The door's open. There's Demon. All right? Isn't that great to know he'll be there? Sandy, as faithful as they come. When you see that, there's a little favor comes up in you. You like people that are faithful. Well, one or two are not in their heads. One or two is, will this please be over? I'm very convicted and I didn't want to come. All right, I'll, I'll finish it soon. All right. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, this is a big boy. Listen to what the Lord says. If I touch your heart, you will become wholehearted. You can only trust in the Lord with the whole heart if the whole heart's been touched by God. So in other words, you have to let the Lord touch your heart to become wholehearted. If you're wholehearted, then you can trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, this is what stops you. Watch this carefully. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, make God the center of your life and trust what He says, even if circumstances don't seem right. It's a decision. He said, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because your own understanding is affected. How many of you have ever been in real fog, not play fog? You know what I'm talking about by real fog? You can't see a thing. We, were, we, we, we used to live just outside London, and one day we'd, we'd gone to do a meeting, and, and fog dropped into the valley, and, and you literally couldn't see it. I mean, I, I actually read an insurance report where someone had crashed, and they said, well, I was trying to follow the lamppost. And the lamppost on the left became the lamppost on the right, and I found myself in the river. So that, that you're talking about that? Literally, one of us had to get out of the car and walk in front of the cars so that the person driving could see them. That's how thick the fog was. How many of you know that's scary? And in those days, most, almost every car was stick shift. You know, see so you. How many of you know it's very foggy when you lean on your own understanding? Because you see, you only understand what you understand. You only see what you see. You only know what you know. Does that make sense to you? So from wherever you came, you have an understanding. But how many of you know your own understanding might not be the key to where you go in the future? You have to lean on God and say, I trust you. I don't understand. There's some things I don't understand. But don't try to understand because you'll never get the answer faithfulness to God will be the key to your life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's a choice. Have you ever watched someone get saved and within minutes they're out running someone that's been around for 20 years? They made a decision to trust God with all their hearts, whereas the other one made a decision to go as far as they wanted. Remember that prophecy I heard a few years ago, this far, no further? It's people who've decided how far they'll go. If you trust God, you trust God. I believe that, you know... Whether it be healing, whether it be anything, I trust God. By the way, we've seen two or three great healings in the church. All right. Keep going. It's nearly over. Your pain is nearly finished. Trust God with all, and lean not on your hands in all your ways. Now, this gets so deep. In the original, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Now, this is going to be deep. It means no God in every way you have, including the wrong way. Invite God into the bad area. It's not like he's going to be shocked. Oh, Michael, did you hear that? I just can't believe that Mike's really got that in his heart. It's not like he's shocked by you. So why not get him involved with you? Acknowledge him in all your ways, your dumb ways, your good ways, your bright ways, and your bad ways. Acknowledge him and say, God, I did it again. And it's not like he went, oh, Dennis, I I gave you you 100, but 101, you're done. If you acknowledge him, I promise you he'll change your ways. If you try to hide it, he who hides his sin does not prosper. If you try to hide it, it won't happen. I'm I'm going to keep going, okay? And listen to what it says. In all your ways, and and he will make your path straight. If you want God to direct you, let God in everything. Isn't that something? Your disappointments, your angers. You're not going to shock God if you're mad at him. If you just say, God, I... You, you do, do it properly. I want to let you know. You have made me mad. 
The Lord goes, I think I need to hide. I think I need to hide. I don't think I can show my face again. He's not your husband or your wife here. He's God. But when you bring God into everything, including the weaknesses, invite him in, my friends. Acknowledge him. Know him. He'll direct your paths. He'll straighten your life out. You're catching this. It's all choices that we make to let God affect our hearts. Can I go just a, a couple more minutes? Right, so, so it then says this. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't look in the mirror and say, there is one bright spark. Have you ever been around someone? Come on, let's be real for a minute. Have you ever been around someone when you try to tell them something, they already know it? And it's funny because I, I think I know a few scriptures. But, but you, you talk to them and they already know that. I know that. Yes, I've already bought that. I don't know if you watched me and uh, Aaron having a conversation. It was very funny. I said, Aaron, did I just see you with a cowboy hat? And he said, yeah, first one. And he said, do you want to try it? I said, no, Aaron, this is not being rude. But I think your head is bigger than mine. <laughs> Be like if Mike Paxton is huge. 83.1 hat. So, <laughs> so I said to Aaron, I said, this gives me a moment, I'm, but I am going to resist the temptation to say what I could say. In other words, your hat won't fit me, mate. It's not supposed to. If you become a big head, you become a dreadnought. The Bible says God lifts the humble up, but he resists the proud. Don't be, don't be so hot. You know, I've read the Bible for years. I think I know what I'm talking about. Until the Bible reads you, you haven't read anything. Been there, done that. Got every trophy. Oh, no, you haven't. The one that's got every trophy... What am I saying to you? We need to drop the Western need to be right. We need to drop our pride. We need to drop it and say, my God, I, I don't know anything. I have actually started saying that. My wife will say, what do you think? I don't know. Je ne sais quoi. No sé. That's the first thing you should learn is manage. No, see. <laughs> no comprendo. No entiendo. <laughs> or just look dumb. I like that K, don't you? K? K, senor. I mimic things, you know that. So I'm not being rude. It took me ages to, to take the Mexican a the rest, uh, accent. I, I could take all the British ones. I could mimic the California one. Or the Texan's a bit strange because it's strange. And I could just take, and when I, I tried to take off the Mexican one, I, I couldn't quite get it right. But I practiced quietly. <laughs> Senor, I, I just practiced. <laughs> eh. <laughs> You know, you know, they, they came to help me work in my garden yesterday, and they think I don't know any Spanish. <laughs> and so, so they're running their mouths at each other and, and, and mentioning my name. And like, I, I don't, I'm not that thick. Even if I didn't know it, I figured out what you just said. But guys, <laughs> you, you need to do that. We've got, we've got the Lord, you see. Señor! No comprendo. <laughs> in other words, Lord, I'm a bit thick. Because some of you know I was born in Ireland, so that's my excuse for everything. <laughs> Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what are you saying to me? <laughs> yeah, Jesus, help me. Why, why am I being funny? Because we're so stupid.
Stop, stop acting like you know something. Even when you went to, even when you got, got your degree, you knew nothing. I told you this story before, and I'm, I'm heading to the crescendo. But I, to, I told you this story before. Uh, in England, it's a little tougher to, to pass your driving test. There is a reason for that. The roads have been there before, before man was. And there's these tiny roads, and people park here, and they park here, and they park here. And you've got to learn. You got, so you need to know the width of your car. So many Americans go over there and, and wreck because they don't know the width of their car. And, and here's a shock for you. They drive on the other side of the road, not the wrong side. And, and, and so, you know, I remember going and having driving lessons, driving lessons, driving lessons, driving lessons until I got it. And I remember him, him taking me for the test. And it was a terrible test because they trick you in the test. They literally trick you. They take you up one-way streets and don't tell you you're going there. I want to see if you're going to start. It was just terrible. You're, you're nervous, wreck. And I, I got it, and I passed it. And I sat in the car with this huge, oh, thank you, Lord. And the driver instructor said, now you've passed your test. Now go learn to drive. No, you always told you that. I know why. I've, been, I've seen it. <laughs> Listen, guys. I couldn't miss that. I'm sorry. <laughs> listen, listen. The moment you think you know something, you really don't know anything at all. And you need to walk around with a different spirit. And you need to say, Lord, if I do know, I only learned it because you showed me. But I bet I don't know the whole truth. Listen. Before you make a judgment on another person, you don't know everything. You might have seen an action, but you don't know the heart. You don't know why they were doing what they were doing. You don't have the right to make that statement unless you know. And most of the time, you don't know. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. We need to back off a little and say, I don't think I know, but I'm going to act with that person like, like, like I love them enough to overcome that fault. This gets good in a minute. This gets good in a minute, okay? So don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9.10, is the beginning. Fear the Lord, which means when I act and when I think and when I speak, God is in the whole picture. All right? I'm getting to the end because some of you look worn out. Listen to what it says. Listen, now follow it again. Listen to what it says. I'm going to read it to you again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge or know him. He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. He said, I'm telling you something. You ready for it? This will bring health to your body, all right? And it will bring nourishment to your bones, in other words, it will teach you how not to become bitter and resentful so that you affect your bones. Last statement. Isn't it interesting, when I do what God says, when I hide His Word in my heart, when I bind His love and faithfulness on my heart, when I, I give my heart to trust God, it affects me. And one of the signs of a person that is being given to God with all their heart is they're generous. Isn't it interesting that we're to pray to the Lord, give us today our daily bread. And I could really explain that. But we pray to the Lord, give us today our daily bread. But why? Because He wants to give it to you. God so loved that He gave. Have you noticed that when we are touched by God, our hearts are touched by God, we become generous. You always know someone touched by God. There's just a spirit of generosity all over them. They're always looking for moments. They're praying to be blessed so they can bless. So listen to what it says. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I'm giving you a hint, says the Lord. Let me get into your heart. Set your heart on the things of God. Overflow in generosity and I will prosper everything that you do. 
Why? Because, because you are now adding to my work in your heart. You are, you're, you're putting an addendum onto what I've started to do. You're doing it. In other words, my heart is as much affected by God as I allow it to be or as I add to it. It's my job. That's why Colossians 4 tells us, and Ephesians, Ephesians, Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 tell us, add, 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 add. Do something about your walk. Now, here's a hint as we bring this to a, to a culmination. Has anybody in here ever worked out? I'm not talking about what's happening to you now. <laughs> I, I, I don't want you to say... You can tell I used to. No. <laughs> if you've ever worked out, do, does it hurt? No, no pain, no gain? Whether you've been an athlete that's run, you have to train. Whether you, you've done weight training, if you don't ache, you haven't worked out. Is that true? Adding to our walk with God and our hearts costs us pain. It costs us time. It costs us effort. It costs us confession. It costs us having to ask somebody else to, to look at our lives to see if they really are what we pretend them to be. There's, there's, a, there's a cost. Uh, when we laid some uh, dirt yesterday and we moved some stone, uh, I, I, you know, again, I'm sorry for telling you that I fractured my back when I was a young man. And so when I, when I looked at the x-rays... I actually landed off a tree, I fell off a tree onto a stump, and I'm, I'm blessed by God that I wasn't crippled. And so the fourth lumbar is fractured off. And every now and then it slips. So like if I'm praying for you and you get touched by God, which are, you know is my, my longing, don't pull me. That's why the guys jump up to help me. Well, I was bending up and down like this all day long. And then last night I went to get up and I went, Oh, and I've learned how to do this now. What you don't know is that hurts terribly. So I could retire, really. I could just sit there and say, oh, it hurts so badly. But I think I'm going to sit on a rocking chair and let all the young men do all the work for me. I say, thank you, Rudy, over there. Chris, over there. Home, yes, thank you. I remember when I used to do this. <laughs> Actually, I sat down. I wish I hadn't done that. But, so you just learned to pull yourself up. In other words, it cost me to do what I was doing. My wife even got a little annoyed. She said, what's wrong with you? I've been trying to find that out for years. <laughs> she said, why are you working so hard? I said, because the guys came around to help me. And the girl, who works harder than the guys. She does too. But bottom line, guys, is it costs me to do what I just did. Now, when you see me walk out like this, you know, it, it really costs me. But bottom line is, if it doesn't cost you, you didn't win anything. You didn't gain anything. I mean, when you first got saved, yes, the Lord did give you a little bot body. But, but then he, he wanted to grow you up. And you, you come to the place where not only do you walk on your own, but you feed yourself, but you grow in God because you chose to. Age has got nothing to do with it. There's nobody in here has worked that hard for God that you don't need to add anything else to your life. And there's no one that young says, no, 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 I'm only this old and it's your job, Dad, to feed me. He said, I fed you. Now get hold of something for yourself. What are we saying? God wants to touch your heart, but he wants you to be involved. I'm even like it. Christine, we talk to each other. We pray for it. We're always trying to add to our hearts, check our hearts, deal with our... I want to I go out fully, fully given to God with a heart that's movable, the heart that teaches me, and a heart that pleases him, a heart that overflows onto you. 
Lift your hands. I don't know, Nikki is Sash? Oh, she is. This is really important. This is worship, my friends. Worship is not just me lifting my hands when she plays. It's not just me giving. Worship is when I give myself to God. I want you to make some decisions today. I am going to be involved in my heart. If, you, if you've been leaning on your own understanding, you need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I drop this. Um, I drop my arguments and I, I grip you again. And Lord, where I've not bothered with the word, I want to hide it again in my heart. I want to become a hoarder. Oh God, but love and faithfulness. I'm inviting you, Holy Spirit, to, to touch us. I'm inviting you to move us. I'm inviting you, Lord, to, to, to help us have hearts that can be so receptive, so movable, so touched. As David said, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O God, and know my thoughts, I pray. See, Lord, if there be anything in me, anything wicked, anything wrong, that you can point it out so that my heart can yield again. So the most important thing we can do today is say, Lord, I give you my heart again. I invite you in again. I believe that right now is the moment. Don't, don't go out and just grab lunch. Right now is the moment where I do business with God. I have to say this to you. You came in here which means this was a God's timing. How's your heart? Is there anything that needs to be shed? You have no idea how much the Holy Spirit wants to move on you right now. All over the auditorium, He wants to move. He wants your heart, because with your heart, He can do anything. I don't know if you could sing this for me, Sash. Spirit, move me. The reason I wanted to sing this is because we want to be moved by God to become the people that God wants us to be. I don't know if you need to walk to the front. I don't know if you need to lean on the platform. I don't know if you need to drop. But don't miss opportunities. Just as the trees move by the wind, so do I move by the Spirit. Oh, Spirit, move me. Spirit of God, come have your way. Spirit, move me. Cutting across the hall. 
You ready now? Spirit move me. Spirit move me. Spirit of God, come have your way. Spirit, move me. As we were worshiping, suddenly I, I saw that there's somebody in the auditorium right now, and you are, you are placed at a moment of great decision. I see you. You've just come, and you've stood like at a crossroads of decision. And you're being pushed on both sides to make a decision. But the Lord just said to me, whoever you are, He said, don't make a decision under pressure. Wait on me, and out of your own heart, I will direct you. You actually even came in here today saying, I wonder if I'll get a word from God. I need to make a decision. The Lord says, I'll direct your heart. The Holy Spirit, we're asking in response to today that you would just fill this room with your presence, that you would draw men and women to a heartfelt decision. We want to be filled to the brim with you, overflowing in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout these words out, touch my heart. Oh my God, I yield it to you. Show me anything that you need to change. I want to agree with you. Hallelujah. Now the altar teams are going to be at the front for those that need prayer. And so, uh, you know, please feel free. We have some, see, some folks really touched by God. But the biggest thing is what you do right now. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands. I just got a feeling we should praise the Lord. Come on. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.